Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 40. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And all the way across the town, Matt. Across at least one town. We're over the hill. We're in the same town, Matt. No, I mean like in podcast years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're middle-aged now, 40 episodes. What it's, I'm wondering is how much of this 40th podcast you plan to dedicate to your new favorite NHL mascot. Oh, yeah, the, the the whole thing, really. So I discovered today, apparently this is an internet thing that I was not aware of until earlier today, that the new Philadelphia Flyers mascot is incredible. Have you seen this, well, Orion? No, I have not. It looks like... I, I've put it in the Slack before. Oh, really? I don't remember that. Yeah, M- Mark, did you... Okay, describe him. And did you read that description somewhere? No. Well, I was watching a video and people were talking about it and they didn't have the exact description I used, but something similar. It looks like a Muppet addicted to meth. It, it is a meth Muppet. That is exactly what it is. Yes. Like, that's, that's precisely what it looks like. And I cannot believe that's an actual professional sports mascot. That's insane. Anyways. Yeah, but in, in talking about this earlier, what you didn't realize is that he acts like a meth head. Is that what I, I'm not familiar with, with the lingo. He's got the googly eyes. He's very rude to people. I which mean, I assume meth I guess, heads are, but I, I guess I, the I, point is they had to go, or the idea I imagine is they had to go really extreme because the Phillies, their only notable aspect is that they have apparently the most loved mascot in baseball, which is just this kind of green fuzzy thing. But apparently it's people like them, the fanatic, but I guess they felt the need to compete with their own baseball team and get something even crazier. Well, I think they're going to win because when, when gritty came out, it was like, this is not a Philadelphia thing. This is, this is a Muppet. But then the Muppets started like, shooting people in the back with t-shirt cannons and <laughs> knocking kids over. And we realized that this is the most Philadelphia thing ever. Yeah. It seems in line with the stereotype of Philadelphia. Although I didn't get too much rudeness or belligerence when we were there last year, I guess we were most of the, you know, 90% of the time in a convention center, but yeah, no, I think Philadelphia is a lovely city. It's, it's, it's the sports. Stereotype. Seems nice. Yeah. You know what this mascot looks like, Matt? It looks like it should be on Yo Gabba Gabba. Yo Gabba Gabba. (laughs) I want a I want a metalcore gritty video right now, like now. Yeah, it would be good for that. Although I have to note that when I I I proclaim my new allegiance to this mascot. You were angry at me, so I decided to look up the Penguins mascot, which is a penguin in name, but it looks nothing like a penguin. Yeah, but when's the last time anyone talked about the Penguins mascot? Still, you would think... Because in Pittsburgh, we play good hockey. So it's a a creature of penguin colors, but it has the beak of a toucan. (laughs) Penguins don't have beaks like that. Nor are their two, beaks usually two cans yellow. Or two cans are lovely, Mark. Yeah, but they're not penguins. They live in exactly the opposite climate of a penguin, of most penguins. Penguins live all over the place. Warm, cold. Yeah, but they're, most of them are cold. Look, I don't need there are a number in South Africa and like New Zealand, but okay. Anyways, that's enough hockey talk. It has been a while since we've last podcasted. Mostly my fault. Um, anything notable happened during that time? I, don't, I, I think it was pretty pretty boring and uh, not I life-changing at all. Yeah, little trip. Little trip. Got some jewelry. Prior to that, I got married. So that was good. <laughs> Acquired some new bling. I do have new bling. Yeah, finger it's bling. Shi- that sounds it's the shiniest thing that I've worn on a regular basis. That's good. That's. I'm glad you've never worn anything shinier than that. <laughs> but uh, yeah lovely. now i'm in my new apartment amber's here oh yeah she She's wants waving. to hop in i told and, her that uh, i would drag her in and she shook her head of course she's i don't think she's played any of the games we're going to talk about today no i don't think so but 
Yeah. Well, congratulations, Matthew. Even though I already congratulated you because I was there. All right, let's talk about board games. We are going to be talking about area majority games today, specifically area majority. Uh, I mean, a little bit of area control, but I want to focus on the majority games just mostly because we've been playing, uh, or we played a couple of them recently, and we've been talking about them quite a bit. So first, what is area majority and how does it differ from area control? How I would define it is that area majority gives you points or bonuses or some kind of positive gain, not just for being first place or having control of an area. So in other words, you would get some kind of bonus uh, for being the second most or the third most there. I don't know. I guess you could draw the line between where you'd say area control is when the game forces exclusive ownership of a given geographical region and majority just means that multiple people can be there. But I don't think that line is nearly as important as whether or not it's a binary win lose or if it's a ranked situation. So I don't know what, how most people use it, but that's kind of where I'm drawing the line. Honestly, I'd say that those two definitions are pretty intertwined. Most of these area majority games allow for more than one person to be in the same area and therefore the ranked possibility arises, right? Well, I'm saying it has to have some kind of ranked benefit. Okay. It, it can't be a binary, either there is a controller or a not controller. It has to be on a gradient somehow. Yeah. Um, because I think that's the most meaningful distinction in terms of how the games feel and how they're played. Um, although, I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, colloquially, we use the words interchangeably in area control is, is sure. kind of an extremely broad category. But I kind of want to focus in on the difference between games that give ranked points and games that just have geographical areas that can be controlled. Uh, So the area majority games that we've played that we've been playing recently are El Grande, probably from what I understand, the original area majority game, Dominant Species, which is one of our favorite games, and The Expanse, which is a new one that we've gotten from Jeff Engelstein, uh, which has this area majority concept very reminiscent of El Grande, but it integrates uh, card driven war game mechanisms as part of it. Some area control games that I thought of just to give an idea of kind of how broad area control can get as this, as this mechanism. Uh, the ones I thought of small world, twilight struggle, twilight imperium, inish, blood rage, risk, diplomacy, war of the ring, uh, 1960, the making of the president and go. I guess it could be said that Go is the ultimate area control game, or at least the very first one, because it is entirely about controlling large portions of area, uh, which I guess makes it somewhat unique from later uh, area control games, which are largely about battling over discrete or like single points. Go, you surround areas and therefore control them. Yeah, uh, that, that one's unique as well in that once a piece is placed it remains where you put it. So you're fighting for control, but you're not actually like bouncing the other person's piece out of a region. Well, you are. If you, if you actually surround a piece, it, it gets removed from the, from the field. Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess I don't even know the rules. It's just a game. lot of the time you get to a point where both sides know how that will play out. So it's not advantageous to spend a turn starting that to play out. But if one side does, then the other, then, then there's just a bunch of force moves and you resolve it. If that makes sense. So when we're talking about area control, I'm usually talking about games that have some kind of geographic aspect to it. I mean, you could, you could argue that ticket to ride, I guess, is an area control game since you're controlling these route areas, you know, it's, it's all, it's, mostly aesthetics, you know, that they're long strings instead of like a single, you know, it could be a hex. It wouldn't make much sense thematically for Ticket to Ride, but you could have hexes of various, you know, control values rather than this needs six trains. It would be effectively the same game. 
Again, you have the problem there where you're not actually removing trains. Well, I mean... But yeah, with that, you never move a train. You never remove a train. You don't get any lasting benefit for holding something. Yeah, so but I still think it has the ge- geographical aspect to it. it. It's maybe worth kind of pinning down the wider genre here. I mentioned this to, to Amber earlier, and, and she asked about Catan. I mean, Catan has the area... It has the geography that you're you're kind of bickering over, but it, it takes place very slowly, and it's not really about the the area control, even though yeah, the I mean, is important. it has the it has the non adjacency rule for um, settlements. Is that what the little ones are called? Settlements. It's been years yeah. since I played Catan. Yeah, and you can, which block, I guess is a little you bit fight over getting to a certain point to prevent someone else from going through that point. Sure, and that's why I think, like, area control is often used, and I think it is in Catan, is just, like, one of many different mechanisms in the game. I wouldn't call yeah, Catan okay. an area control game, but that aspect of that. it is area control. So, to me, area control as a phrase kind of, in my mind, encompasses a very broad mechanism of when you're fighting over geography, whereas area majority seems like a very specific type of mechanism in terms of like ranked geographical control does that work for you guys can you repeat the last two or three sentences sure for me area control is often just one of many different mechanisms in a game and it just comes down to fighting over or conflict over geographical spaces whereas area majority seems to be something much more specific about kind of this ranked control um, where points or benefits are given out based on first, second, third presence in an area. I think that that, that works for me. I might break it into to a third category of, uh, you mentioned small world earlier, where or, or risk, where it is very much kind of a shif- shifting bounds of control. I might call that area control proper, Whereas a lot of these other games, Twilight Imperium, Blood Rage, even Diplomacy, I think War of the Ring, war games in general, I would put into the, what you were describing as have that area control is one mechanism in the game. Yeah, I, I mean, we might feels d- unique in, in that group. Really? What what makes Risk unique for you? Because it is a hundred percent about that shifting border you know a twilight imperium you kind of have a border but you can also send your ships past enemy lines there's lots of space that isn't there's so much else going on that it's not about the geography the geography is is the field that you play on but the risk is about the shifting lines it's about it's a hundred percent about controlling space yeah i mean it's more simplistic i suppose in that that is and, kind of the only thing World going on. Is a little more of a of a com- complex game than Risk, but it is it's still the same thing. Of it's a hundred percent about this is where the you know the lines of control are. These are the these are the spaces that are mine. Yeah. See, I don't I don't under, I don't see how that's different than you know Twilight Struggle or Twilight or any of the things I list. They all have spaces that you possess at one time or another. The other ones don't have other things going on, but I don't think that takes away from the fact that they're area control games. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is certainly a looser distinction than between this and area majority. I think that in like in some of these games, you don't necessarily need to control as much space. I think there are different strategies. There are different things you can do. So maybe it is just area control with a bunch of other mechanisms uh, built on top of it, but mm-hmm. um, kind of feels unique to me when kind of the whole game is about that the the lines of of control. Yeah, I suppose. But anyways, moving on past the definitions, the reason I think that this distinction between area control and area majority is interesting because area majority games feel like to me essentially geographical auction games. Whereas area control feels more rooted in abstract games or war games. 
So area majority games, you know, the three that we mentioned feel much more like they have Euro lineages rather than abstract or war lineages. They feel like they're coming off of an auction game just with a map rather than a game like Diplomacy or Risk or Go. And the primary reason for that is that when I'm playing an area majority game, I'm often thinking more in terms of uh, resource efficiency, where I'm thinking, okay, what is the number of points that this particular cube is giving me? Or how can I be more efficient with how I'm allocating these cubes? Whereas in an area control game, I'm thinking more of efficiency in terms of my actions and the tempo of the game. And I guess more direct reacting to other players rather than reacting to kind of the board state of how things have changed. I guess those are fairly fairly nebulous distinctions, but the, the two different styles of games very much feel completely distinct to me in terms of their approach, or in terms at least of my approach when I'm playing one. I see where you're coming from, but I think dominant, well, all of these games are much closer to a war game than, say, Viticulture or Agricola or some other kind of standard Euro. But then don't they feel more like an auction game to you? Like, specifically because you're essentially, when you move cubes into, or whatever they are in, in the game you're playing, into a particular area, you're essentially bidding for a certain point result out of that at different points in the game. I, I suppose at, like, a tactical level that's true, but I the way it feels, it's... It feels like a war game. It feels more like Twilight Imperium than some, you know, engine building game. Yeah, I guess that I'm not necessarily comparing it to engine building. I guess it specifically does feel like an auction to me, which I suppose you could argue that anything with area control is an auction. It's just whether or not it's a binary or a tiered result. But I'm thinking, I feel like I'm thinking much more in terms of my resource efficiency uh, again, not necessarily with engine building. There's not a whole lot of snowballing in the, in that sense. It's still a lot more conflict-based, but it's less conflict-based when you have strategies that open up to you where you can maybe uh, sneak in and get second place in a lot of areas rather than fighting over control of one particular area where you can be a bit more passive and a bit more... Yeah, I'm passive, I suppose, in yeah, how you distribute your cubes. Yeah, probably the right word. I'm not sure I'm on board with you, Mark. Uh, I think I see where, where you're coming from. Um, I'm going to bring up a specific one. In, in our recent plays of The Expanse, I think you, in particular, did a good job in both games of recognizing that you don't need to outright win any areas. And like you said, that the strategy kind of opened up for you to just play well in a lot of areas rather than really dominating a couple areas. I don't know that I would say that that's like categorically different than a game where you're just going for outright control. It's just a matter of how much control you're going for. Think about it this way. Like when you look at a game like El Grande or The Expanse in particular, you have this bucket of cubes and more or less a large portion of them, if not all of them, are going to be out on the map at the end of the game. And what you're doing throughout the game is just trying to get the highest expected point value out of each of those cubes, given that they're going to be on the map. And the game is just different barriers to you moving your cubes wherever you want and extra costs and such for different types of movement. But everyone's okay. going to have their cubes out there it's just a matter of allocating them efficiently and then being able to do that within the other constructs of the game. Yeah, I think that what you're describing is more specific to individual games than to area, area majority as a whole. Because I think about how that works in El Grande, where there is more moving of cubes versus The Expanse, where it's really more about getting all your cubes down and then manipulating them at very specific points you're really not moving cubes all that much 
Right, but I don't think you have to move them. You're just getting them onto the board. I don't know. Your example sounds a lot like Twilight Struggle. I, I Okay, I think you're trying to make this point and you're abstracting things out so far that it's become this nebulous, almost contrived construct that you're arguing. I, like, I don't know. The idea of you have this many resources to allocate across the whole game and you're trying to get the most points out of it. I mean, that's like 70% of board games or something. Or any game with victory points. Right, but I'm not saying that you need to use the resources. I'm saying you geographically have to distribute them. That's specific to this kind of game. In other games, the resources may be more specific to actions, where you have to, each action needs to be super you, efficient. I think you face the same problem in Risk, though. You're, you're, each turn, you're given a number of units to distribute to the, you know, the... The, the places on the map that need those units and you have to wisely distribute them. The problem is a little bit different because you're not directly placing them for control. You're placing them for power to attack or defend. Right. And that's what I'm saying. The distinction is. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so in other words, the, the reason okay. it feels yeah, like an auction to me is that in an auction game, you're going to have a specific amount of money and you want each of those marginal dollars to have, you know, if you play correctly, you're distributing those dollars in order to get the highest expected point return from them. That's where the parallel feels similar to me. I think ultimately Orion's right in that every game has a specific number of some kind of resource and you're trying to get a high expected output from them. That's basically every game, but these area majority games seem abstracted at their core. Like you can see the bucket of resources and you see the expected point value when you put them out and the kind of limiting, the, the most limiting factor seems to be the number of cubes you have rather than in say an abstract game like go where the limiting factor is specifically your actions. So in other words, if you do not spend a single action, well, that can turn the tide of the game, which is more, which is, you know, feels like it's moving along the lines of war games more. I feel like action efficiency is a little bit less important in these kinds of games rather than kind of ultimately positioning yourself for being efficient with your resources. But the more I talk about it, the more the line seems really thin. So maybe I'm talking myself out of my main point here. <laughs> That's what I would but say. I, think I would it's, say at best I think it's, there's a thin distinction here. Yeah. It's one of those things where I, I, I feel like it's something distinct or relatively distinct, but it's, and, it's and hard again, for me I, to I'm explain say why. Again, I think that it's more dependent on the individual games because I think you're right, maybe in El Grande, but in, in The Expanse... It's not so much you have a certain number of cubes and it's just how to use them right. You can gain a huge advantage by getting more cubes out early, as I did to great effect in the last game. In Dominant Species, there's just a lot more going on that I don't, I don't think I agree that it's, it's really about managing that finite number of cubes. Yeah, there's more going on in Dominant Species. Yeah, I think Dominant Species is the least like the others of those three. I think what you can say is that all of these games involve placing your troops or influence or cubes or whatever onto the board in the geographical distribution. And the area majority ones, you get points for being second place, which allows other strategies than pure control or having the most things there. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ryan, I'm on board with that. I, I thought that that's where Mark was going to go with this. And then, Mark, you hit us with with this other uh, abstracted theory. Yeah, I guess I, I made it a bit more esoteric than it might need to be. But what else am I here for? Yeah, like Orion said, the, the kind of unique thing here is because you can because you can get benefits for being in second or third place or not necessarily having exclusive control of an area it opens up other strategies where maybe you try to do that and you try to spread spread yourself out 
Uh, I think dominant species does that really well by encouraging certain species to maybe go for that. It also yeah. has the, uh, the glacier where you can spread yourself out on that glacier, even though it's by itself is extremely low scoring in terms of points, but it has a specific mechanism where if you have the most species on the glacier tiles, you get points based on how many glacier tiles you're occupying. So it creates these alternative avenues for points. That um, many species, you're, you're kind of, you're balancing all these different risks to your species out there on the board that it, it is about fighting for dominance in as many places as you can, but you're, you're dealing with all these other risks of resources and glacier, as you mentioned, that there are, yeah, a multitude of kind of strategies that emerge around that beyond just kind of simple area control. Yeah. Which brings another point to mind that I feel like these area majority games, it's a bit easier to come back from a devastating blow because you're not like permanently removed, not necessarily permanently removed from a space. If you lose control of it as someone who's trying to take control, there's often a tough decision of, do I just kind of step over that line and be efficient and get one more than maybe the next uh, person? Or do I try to establish an even firmer control and maybe wipe someone out or, or get two or three advantage, which is an interesting decision that you don't necessarily see, you know, in, like in Risk or something or in Twilight Imperium. If you win the spot, you've won the spot. Like there's no, there's no gradient there. There's no different levels of control. When you're fighting over a spot, you either conquer it or you lose or you retreat or something. So I think that decision's interesting. When you're able to remove pieces or add a bunch of pieces to a particular spot, do you just go for the most efficient play or the one that will give you a stronger grip on, on the area? All right. So I, I really enjoy where area majority games allow that kind of second place. Oh, what's the economic term? I guess no, I'm thinking of something else where it allows those strategies where you kind of spread broadly and not necessarily win a lot of areas, but get, you know, small amounts of points from many areas. Although in dominant species, it adds the wrinkle of, of dominance, which is different from having the most uh, cubes in an area or species in an area where you're the most adept at surviving in that area, which can be significant, which I think is one of the, one of the two primary things that makes that, that game kind of stand out among these three that we're talking about. But before talking about, again, the specific games, there's one more point I wanted to talk out generally about the genres, and that is that, and this isn't exclusive to area majority games, but I think you can kind of see see it laid bare a bit more in these games compared to many, and that is that because they tend to be a bit more abstract, I'm thinking more specifically of El Grande and the expanse of this kind of cube auction for spaces, the real game and what makes it interesting and unique and something not banal is the, is the restrictions in how you place, move, uh, score. And that's really the variation because the core of it, of you just count how many cubes are in an area is the same across the board. And if it was just a matter of placing one cube at a time, onto areas and then scoring, that would be an incredibly boring game. So it's really yeah. games about giving you hurdles and opportunities for doing that very simple thing of placing a cube in a space. Yeah. Which again, you can say that about any game, you know, Zulkin's about turning one color of cube into other things. And if it was just a simple exchange thing, it would, be boring, but you have all the different ways of acquiring various resources and exchanging them in different ways and turning them into different types of benefits. And that's really so, kind of the, the meat of it. But I think it's so interesting all that the games that we've declared as area majority, um, they share something else in common 
which isn't exclusive, but is is kind of central to, to these area majority games. At at different points along the gameplay, the control is uh, converted into points in in some kind of a scoring round. I think in in El Grande it is at set points. Yeah, and then it's in the at the the third the thirds. So after th- third after point. three, six, and nine rounds, yeah. Expanse is when these scoring cards come up that players have to have to select dominant species. It's uh, at the end of each round. Yeah, it's yeah. at the end of each round, and it's based on how many people. You only score the tiles that you choose to, or the people that did dominance choose. Yeah, so it's right. up to five spaces each round based on who goes in that action spot. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, and, and maybe this is also kind of tying them back to Euro games. There is kind of a there's gamemanship around getting in good position and then timing a scoring well um, mm-hmm. to collect to collect on 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 the scoring. I had an original point that this was all building to, which I cannot remember. <laughs> that's right. Well, 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 that's an interesting thing though, because in in most games, there's either a scoring at the end, or a certain score causes the end. In a strict area control, sometimes it's just you gain utter control. Right, yeah. You know, it's just dominance. Or you just kind of trickle in points based on your strategy. So maybe there's a strategy where you you do trickle points. So, you know, think of suburbia, right? You can have strategies where you're just getting points more or less constantly throughout the game. Or you have strategies where you're building an engine up for a big payoff right. at the end there aren't oh, that yeah. many yeah, games yeah. outside of these that i can think of that have kind of discrete scoring rounds separate or mostly yeah. separate from the actions of the players just timed in there yeah i remember my point now um basically because these games have some sort of map uh this more complicated area majority minority exists and it works up to certain points of scoring that's the central kind of conceit of the game but the the building of the game out from there is what makes each game so unique and so interesting and we find all of these games interesting because i think you can do so much with it dominant species does that that whole amazing action pun thing which is fantastic in and of itself uh, but it's all done to manipulate the area majority board El Grande is a, is much simpler, but still very interesting in kind of the uh, the bidding and the finality of your bidding cards and things like that. The Expanse takes more of the coin style or war game style. Uh, it's Twilight uh, Struggle specifically. Event card. Yeah, that's kind of the 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 you know the structure around that central area majority. Yeah. That's all I had in terms of general points. Do we want to get into these three specific games? Let's just quickly talk about, in general, I think, Matt, you had said you're particularly prone to AP in these sorts of, especially the majority style games. Yeah. Do you want to talk about maybe why you think that might be? Yeah, let's talk about that now. That's a good point. You know, we've we've mentioned and joked about before that you tend to be the worst sufferer of analysis paralysis among our immediate group and these games and these games seems seem to really get you and i'm curious if you've thought about why that is yeah so i think in improving um in analysis paralysis i've kind of learned something about what it is that that makes me struggle so much in making decisions in, in some games i think the the key thing in these area you know, majority games is you're playing on these weird margins everywhere. So, you know, as you said, Mark, you never have to have complete dominance. You can play in a way where you you just do well in a bunch of areas rather than doing great in a few areas. Um, so what that does, I think, is it makes it harder to decide on the optimal play because the optimal play is hidden behind so many layers of and it's also at some future time because you yeah don't necessarily yeah know where in placing my cu- cube will I actually get the most efficient benefit from in the future at different times based on what everyone else is going to be doing in response to what I'm doing. 
I don't know, in a game like Twilight Imperium, it's, you know, it, it's super complicated, obviously, but you're going for more objectives. Like, on this turn, I want to get this planet, or <laughs> I want to establish dominance on this border so that I'm safe. Whereas in the expanse, it's I'm going to place two or three cubes and I could put them on half of the planets and that's going to affect these four-way dynamics by this tiny amount. Okay, where, what's the best play? I can just run in circles and, and you know, in that situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. It's interesting because especially with the expanse, to me... Less so with Dominant Species, more with The Expanse and El Grande. For me, those kinds of games, until you near the last quarter of them, it's like, okay, I'm going to get most of my cubes out by the end of the game one way or another. It seems like there's in those games, there's always going to be a lot of fine plays. There's going to be a lot of different things I can do to get cubes out, to, to take control or to get into scoring opportunities. And so when I see one... I just kind of go for it, and then I just kind of run through a check to make sure I'm not doing something completely disastrous. But until the game nears the end when you're really kind of... Well, I'm also yeah. thinking about kind of the relative strength of everyone. So I'm thinking, okay, if I can target this one person or these two people um, and then do a fine play in the process, I'll just do that. Uh, Whereas you're so trying to figure out kind of the... The, the correct move among those, that kind of wide range right. of fine moves. Yeah. Two things. I think, first of all, uh, when we originally talked about analysis paralysis, you coined the term or found the term satisficing. Found it. Which is basically at what threshold of certainty that a move is a good move. Are you satisfied enough to make the move, make the decision, take your turn? Though I've gotten much better at setting that threshold in a socially acceptable <laughs> level, um, in area majority, I think those margins are just so much grayer because you're dealing with balancing complicated majority minority situations among four players. I just think that those the threshold of what is a good play and not a good play is just more difficult. And you're able to say, Hey, I'm going to get my cubes out for me. It, that situation just brings the analysis paralysis. Uh, the second thing is I think it's hard to, first of all, say who's actually in the best position in, in these games where it's not obvious. Someone might actually have, a certain configuration of cubes that gives them a really efficient board presence that is hard to recognize at times. And it, and they are games with just dynamics where there's so much pushing and pulling that it could go in a different way. So I, I find it hard to, to, to actually say, okay, I'm just going to do something that directly disadvantages Mark. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, I, and I do, you know, like in the last game of The Expanse, I didn't recognize h quite how strong your position was until I really thought about the ramifications of you having the tie break, which I should have known because any game in which, you know, there's, there's conflict over two or three things and someone gets the opportunity to win ties, that's just massive. Right. right. Um, <laughs> like, you know, looking back, that was obvious. It wasn't like I missed some minute detail. The thing for me is that I think in these kinds of games, compared to an engine building style Euro, if you compare to what feel like relatively similar plays in terms of value or efficiency or, or you know, that kind of thing, yeah. the, the impact of being slightly wrong versus slightly right doesn't seem to push out very far into the future because there's so much change going to be happening. And, and a lot of the impact of whatever you do is going to be dependent on yeah. what other Honestly, people do. Mark, that might be why I have so much trouble with it. Because uh, you're trying to find a farther reaching impact than there is. Yeah. Cause it, it, it feels <laughs> like if you just think about it a little bit more, you'll see where the impact is plays out a little bit further down the line. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um, I, I, and I, I think that that's... Originally, when we played D Dominant Species, and 
you know, we had an intervention where you guys said, Matt, you got to play faster. That's basically what we said is it, it, I, I just feel like I could can think about this a little bit more and understand the implications of what I'm doing a little bit better. You know, in in, in more Euro E engine builders. Uh, well, it, well, the thing is, in engine builders, that the far reaching implications of a given move toward the earlier mid game can be big. Because right, but, effects but tend to be exponential. Usually more clear. Or I can at least set a a strategy where I kind of short circuit those you know, those concerns. Whereas mm-hmm. in an area majority game, you're putting cubes down. You're that's what the game is, you're always putting cubes down. So you can always consider whether one more cube in X or Y position is better. Yeah. It, it's also interesting thinking about this kind of, again, more in the abstract, that typically games where you have a lot of player interaction, the kind of, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, the, the foresight or the kind of the tail effects of a decision tend to be flattened because there's more player balancing, whereas in a more kind of multiplayer solitaire engine building type of game tail effects tend to be more significant just because other people can't interact with them and just the way you know engine building tends to be satisfying is with is with slightly exponential effects but then you have this weird category of games and now i'm thinking i'm going off topic on a tangent here of games like carl chuddick's games like innovation which have a lot of conflict but also have very dramatic impacts of things that can't necessarily be flattened out. And I, and I suppose that's why those style of games tend to be more um, hit and miss for people because it's, it's a dynamic in in that very abstract way that, that only certain people like what you eventually get to is just the game is super swingy. (laughs) I think another part of these games that I struggle with is in the way that Matt struggles to, keep find, thinking to find the right move. I struggle because the consequences of my moves are often determined by what other people are going to do in the mm. future. Um, in the same way that right. in Twilight Imperium, you want to score points without looking too threatening. In these games, you want to score points without looking too threatening because everyone else can just come down on you. And wipe you off the board and then you're out of it. Or at least you're set way behind. Yeah, it's a psychological game, the 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 diplomatic or the political game. And I think that's maybe the biggest reason why I can't view these games as an auction of just getting my cubes down, because I'm trying to balance that and also given three possible spaces, which one hurts the leader. But as Matt said, finding the leader at a given moment can be hard to find because the scoring might not happen for another two rounds. And and maybe I'm just trying to be too cute on this and I should just get my cubes out in a position that will probably score. I no, know. and I think Mark has the right mindset for these games. And this is why I have a love-hate with these games. Dominant Species is that game that I hate playing every time we play it and then I want to play it again immediately <laughs> when we're done. Um, well, I think I have the right mindset for I playing can't get quickly. Into your mindset of just like we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do basically these things, but we're gonna just get some cubes out, and then when it crunch time comes, we'll we'll figure out the details. I think to a certain extent, that's what you have to do, and and I'm really bad at doing that. <laughs> well, and also in the in the political dynamics, I tend to just gut roll those. Like, except at Twilight Imperium, there's there's a little bit more kind of granularity in. Okay, can I? Can I sneak out this particular objective or these two objectives to get into a winning position? But I tend to kind of look at the board, think about the powers that they have or like the potential, you know, how easy it's going to be for them to come back from something or who do I think is poised to score a lot of points in the next scoring round and then just kind of make a gut decision on who I should target in relatively, you know, even decisions otherwise. Which, I mean, like I said, it's the right way to play if you want to play quickly, but I'm not, I don't feel like I'm particularly good at these games either. I would say that Matt often does either surprisingly well or quite well in these games. 
Yeah, I guess I have. I mean, I you won the mm-hmm. expanse. You do. You usually do well in dominant species. Yeah, I've won and come in second place in dominant species. I think I came in second the one time I played El Grande. I so kind of feel. Do I, I kind of felt vindicated edges, at the end of this last of play of the expanse because I did win with a good margin. Yeah, you you and won I felt pretty bad handily for much of the game for taking so long and. And and also just having this internal strife that I don't feel playing most games. Yeah. And then, you know, anecdotally, you win the game and then you're like, ah, it was all worth it. I was right to be in that mindset. <laughs> well, again, going a little bit off topic, we the the next game I, I might be trying to review is is an engine building deck builder. So, well, that's a really that I that we can play on Thursday. <laughs> Although a, kind of a weird one. I have another another thing that yeah, go ahead. is kind of a unique feeling I get in these games. I don't know if you want to talk about this more or whatnot, but when direct conflict happens in these in these games, there are there are kind of situations where someone obviously makes a decision that disadvantages one player. Those situations make kind of I don't know, just eat me up more in these area majority games than than other games i don't i i think that that's true more than a euro game where someone or like an action placement game where someone puts their piece where i want it to go it's just how it goes but in like in the last play of the expanse ben kind of took the earth invasion route early game right Mm mm-hmm it's it's kind of like a, a reasonable opening play certainly as far as i know he could have done something else but he did the earth invasion thing and I was just so frustrated. I was like, ah, this is going to kill all my margins. My entire game's going to be ruined. You know, that's the feeling I have. Yeah. It's obviously not true. Like, I have a question for you. Do you. Yeah, yeah tell me. Is that just as severe with dominant species? Yes, I think so. Oh, okay. It's, it, I was going to speculate. I was going to speculate maybe that dominant species isn't quite as bad because you can see it coming from afar. When they yeah, like maybe place the spot maybe. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm the only other person in that terrain type that they're competing over. I'm definitely going to get a couple cubes knocked off. No, I, th- I think the I think the feeling is very similar because you're just you're thinking like, OK, Orion is making a decision where it doesn't really matter to him. He's going to remove somebody's cube. Yeah. And then when he chooses your cube, you're like, you, know, you could have just as easily choose, chosen Mark's cube. Why do you have to choose my cube? Yeah. In retrospect, it, it's fine. And in retrospect, it's like, obviously, that's the meat of the game. And 30 of those situations arise and even out in the course of the game. But for some reason, in, in these games, that maybe I just get more emotionally involved in these games than any other genre. I mean, cubes are pretty emotionally investing, so. It's hard not to project your emotional being onto a cube i mean it is the most empathetic shape i just made that up well i mean it wasn't a friendship <laughs> sphere or something in Portland, oh yeah, right? yeah companion cube yeah <laughs> i forgot i, I just i just i i wasn't even thinking about portal but i just made the same joke as they did independently so i feel pretty proud <laughs> <laughs> i think for me the most frustrating part of all of these majority games is that i can kind of randomly be screwed by someone as a splash effect of they're not even trying to attack me necessarily they're just trying to do a thing but like matt said they they chose this planet instead of that or they chose this cube instead of that and as a result i might lose a huge amount of points or board position by an action on their time that was more or less a coin flip. And I think that's especially true of El Grande. I I suppose... I can usually, or more often, see the risks and mitigate them or plan around them or something. And there's a little more room in in dominant species. El Grande is a very small country. (laughs) Well, the dominant species, you have the counterplay kind of in the hypothetical, right? So if they put an action pawn on a particular action and you're pretty oh, sure right. that that's going to hurt you, you can make the counterplay before the actual damage has been done. 
sometimes, yep. which, which is, is interesting, brilliant. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, from a from a gameplay kind of narrative, you know, imagination of the mind perspective, I think it's brilliantly done in Dominant Species because you're kind of playing out a scenario in your mind as people go around placing their actions and you alter how that narrative plays out before it actually plays out. You know, it's like a collect it's a collective programming track effectively, uh which is awesome. I love got to play Dominant Species again. Now I just want to play Dominant Species. So I think in terms of the like emotional experience of playing the game, that frustration in El Grande feels similar to how in Churchill you just sometimes you just can't win an issue that you really want to. Right. And it's almost you obviously you're trying to score points, but it's almost more about not being in other people's way. It's also an interesting dynamic in that that problem should be reduced as the players get more experience because they'll be able to better recognize who's in the lead or who's in a better position and again kind of flatten out the points the potential points on the board but then it's a matter of when that happens does the game suddenly get very very dull (laughs) or not which is much harder to analyze how that you can avoid that becoming dull um, or how you can create a rich experience when the players are more experienced. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to a thought I've had about some other games. Maybe not these, but some games I think are better when you make some mistakes. When you're only playing 85% optimally. Which is very different from the mindset going into a pure Euro where you're just trying to grind out every point of efficiency. Right, yeah. Which, man, I wish... We, we've mentioned this a couple times before, and I wish I had more, I don't know, experience or knowledge or just was able to formulate some way of analyzing that in deeper rather than just pointing out that that is a challenge that games have um, or certain games have. But that's kind of the ultimate reduction of this style of game is that it ends up being more or less a tie on potential points scored until someone arises at the end through you know, luck of how the turn order played out or something dumb like that. Or maybe it gets really nuanced and, you know, people can can see further into the future of how consequences of things will be out and that becomes really rich and engaging. It kind of reminds me of the idea from Interstellar where the robot is only 90% honest or something because they decided it's easier for humans to work with it or something like that. Oh, I don't remember that. I have forgotten much much of that movie. Anyways, the, the robots had an honesty setting, which was some um, percentage between 0 and 100. And then I think one of the last lines in the movie, he says, let's bump that up to 95. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's talk. I We've talked about El Grande and Dominant Species pretty much at length before. Let's talk about The Expanse as a game, because... I've played it, we played it three times or two times? I can't remember. I've played it twice. I've played it once. I might have only played it the two times then. And I don't quite know what to think about it. I think it's pretty good, but it also might suffer from just being too simple and too abstracted. I don't know. If it it suffers from one thing, what you just said about these games in general is is so true it's basically a tie in potential points until (laughs) something angling at the end i think yeah that's what i'm saying by being too simple is that it can often be really let me put it a different way in dominant species you're fighting over different axes of control and fighting over different ways of establishing that Um, which is an interesting puzzle. In El Grande, you have this kind of round-by-round tactical thing going on where you're just trying to squeeze out some benefit from each round and set yourself up for a scoring round. In The Expanse, it feels often like, well, this play will let me place three cubes, and this play will let me place two cubes, so I'll do the one with three cubes. Yeah. Or if I do this, if I take the points here, or if I take the card and get the points here, it's going to give this other person a really devastating event, so I can't do that. Which is the same kind of thing that you see in Twilight Struggle, but it doesn't feel nearly as tense as Twilight Struggle. 
it just has, okay, I'll choose a different card because you're not locked into playing that card at some point. You just choose a different card. And then there's other areas of decision where it's like, well, both of these cards will let me do more or less a similar thing, but this one doesn't have my, my faction symbol as an event. So I'll play it and then hopefully I'll get access to that other event later on. So it has some interesting dynamics, but they often feel like at least in terms of which card to take, I often feel like there's one or two or three good choices. And then maybe, you know, again, one to three choices that are just not as good, clearly. Yeah. And maybe there aren't. And the tougher decisions are where to put your cubes, not which card to use. Right, right. There aren't as many opportunities for really clever play based on an an event that does something unique. Well, also the events are just less imaginative. Right, right. So compare it to Twilight Struggle for me, because you guys know the game better. I mean, to me, it seems like basically all of the events in the Expanse are just particular ways of placing cubes or moving ships, which are the things that you're doing anyways. So occasionally they're slightly more advantageous in some way, but it's still pretty much you're doing the same thing that the you were cards, doing if you were just taking action points. The events tend to be more flexible in terms of location, so they might let you place where you don't have a ship, and that's usually the advantage, it seems. Or they'll yeah. let you do things like destroy another fleet when that's not yet available to you in the game as an action point they thing. struggle, though, like, the events are wild, right? They're, they're just... They certainly yeah. can be, which, you know, is the pro and con, the main pro and con of Twilight Struggle is that someone who knows what the cards are and the potential, you know, what you, your opponent might have in hand is going to do much better because knowledge of each individual card is so powerful and keeping track of where particular cards are. In other words, have they been discarded? Are they going to be shuffled in? Whereas in the expanse, it's like, okay, the, the four power cards tend to do slightly better things than the two power cards in their, in their events, but none of them are particularly exciting. It all yeah, seems a little bit stodgy, which so, is which okay. is somewhat disappointing. Well, well, we're, well we're, an we're even better them. comparison yeah. is just is just to dominant species, where the the events can be catastrophic in some cases. Um, literally, one of them is called catastrophe, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> playing that event. No, <laughs> we should point out that in dominant species, the events come in a different way. It's like every time a dominance you happens you get one of those cards if someone is dominant in the region that's chosen which is usually the case you if you take dominance you choose a region in which you're dominant and you get a card yeah so it's more of a round end effect whereas in the expanse it is every turn is choosing one of these cards and using it in some way right as much as we've been talking it down it still works as a game mechanic there's enough variation in what the cards do, even though they're doing very similar things to what you can already do, that it does give some basic tactics to to your turn that combined with the fact that the scoring cards are coming in on the same market. Mm-hmm. I think it I think it does result in some interesting tactical choices. At the end of the day, I think you're right, and you're gonna end up with three or two good plays and it's maybe not worth worrying as much of, uh, as much about the details of what the cards do. Yeah, and then sometimes you have genu- genuinely interesting decisions in terms of which card to select, because maybe, you know, do you do you take the card that gives you three action points over two when the three has your event symbol on it and the two doesn't, because you typically want to keep your events on the display so other people take them and that's kind of a hard thing to quantify which can make interesting decisions or do you take an event that you know someone or do you take a card that you know someone is going to follow with an event because you think that the benefit they gain from that isn't as significant as the benefit of you moving up the initiative track that's you know a more nuanced decision there's some interesting stuff there i just wish the events were more exciting. I think when we got to the end of the game, and I've only played it once, I wasn't entirely sure what I thought. My first reaction was probably that 
this feels like a good game. It's probably good, but I didn't really enjoy it, and I'd have to play it again to have a better read on it. And a lot of that is that we took so long to play it, but the more we talk about it, most I think most of your advantage comes from other people making mistakes, which almost feels out of place in this sort of game. Well, I think one thing we haven't mentioned that's kind of a, I think a plus to the the expanse is the differences between the factions, the specialties, because those feel pretty substantial. And yes, like we mentioned before, we com- we underestimated how powerful your uh, your final tech would be in the final scoring. Whereas that's something again more nebulous to figure out during the course of play, but something as we you know if we play more that we'll be able to recognize and work around. For instance, I find, I think, I think the Mars in in factions um, combined with the, the, the board setup, like the different factions are kind of pushed in certain directions on the actual board. Yeah. There's geographic asymmetry. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really good. I mean, dominant species has really good asymmetry too. It's just proportionally a smaller part of the game. Yeah, I'd say a, a much smaller part of the game. They get little bonuses. This one, it's pretty fundamental to, to your strategy. Uh, for instance, I find the Mars faction really interesting because they're such military powerhouses. So right. they're able to control the military aspect of the game, especially towards the, the, the latter part of the game once they get all their technologies, which can be huge in particular areas. And so I find a lot of my decision-making since I've been playing against them both times I've played is trying to figure out how to make them not come into the spaces where I am and destroy my ships because right, it's costly because yeah. it's costly think, to get ships out and to move them back into position. And I think overall we've been under appreciative of, of the differences in factions. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that I, I played the Mars faction the first time and just having the advantage in both numbers and tiebreaker on military battles is great but you have to figure out how to leverage that to actually get more control on the ground it's not worth anything if you're just you have a super powerful fleet above mars yeah in the same way that well honestly i think the un is the most obvious of the four the un just has these you know super cubes that count as two influence instead of one that's pretty straightforward. You want influence on the ground. At the end of the game, you win tiebreakers on the ground. That's that's pretty straightforward. The other two have advantages in placement. They're able to, what, the outer? Yeah, the outer planets, alliances, the OPA, I think that's what it's called. They have an advantage in that they don't need fleets to place on two-thirds of the board. You, they don't need a fleet in that space. So they can kind of get away with having less of a military presence. The main impact of the protogen is their removal ability, which right. is what your first tech. The, the first tech you can replace another person's cube with one of your own. Yeah, which is super efficient, especially if you can do that in an area where that person doesn't have a fleet, so it makes it much more expensive for them to come back, which is interesting. So protogen seems a bit more subtle, I think, or those two seem a bit more subtle. The, the UN yeah. and the Mars factions are much more blunt force. Okay, we're just better at this thing. And then in the second half of the game, we win ties on the yeah. two areas and, of control. I don't know if long term, if, if this makes the Expanse a better game or not. But it's interesting to try to balance those asymmetries, how the different factions have different advantages at different points in the game. Yeah, because some of them seem a bit better long term or short term. You know, obviously the UN... And the second half of the game is extremely strong. So maybe next time we play, we'll be better at maybe, you know, and maybe we'll air and be overcompensate on trying to diminish how much influence they have on the board in total. But there's a lot of asymmetry there. And, and I think, honestly, now that I've played it twice, the first time I thought the card play was really good in the following. Having played it twice now, that seems a little bit less exciting. And I think the faction differences seem more exciting, especially when you can leverage placement rules and i think the kind of fleet control is probably more part of an advanced players game than it has been in our first two games oh it has to be it has to because be because we just haven't yeah because if you get locked out of a corner of the board 
without any fleet there and no way to place cubes otherwise, you know, maybe events will compensate for that. It can take a whole turn just to get a fleet back over into that corner in terms of placing a fleet and then moving it all the spaces it needs to move. So I think that aspect of the game is most more interesting to me after my second play than after my first. The fleet control and the and the different faction types and how they how they function. Yeah, and I mean just to ground this back in the original conversation, this is all to get cubes on the ground and you want a majority if you can, but if you can get second place in the region, that's great, especially if you have control over which regions are scoring, uh, which is another aspect. Of oh, the game. yeah, yeah. We have to, yeah, the, the, again, lifted from Twilight Struggle, the fact that the scoring cards are shuffled in and that someone has to play a scoring card to score it. Made even more significant here because the person who plays the scoring card gets to choose one of the three segments of the board that scores more points, which I, I think is done pretty well in the game. Um, there's some luck in when the scoring comes up, but you kind of you have an idea of when a card is likely to show up and you know try to get in position. But that's yeah. that's done pretty well. I'll echo what Orion said earlier. This feels like it could be a good game if it were shorter. And the box time is a lot shorter than what we played it at. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it, if this truly was an hour game. I think it's a pretty darn interesting one-hour game. Yeah, I would agree with that. It is unfortunate that it looks so awful, though. If we're doing the kind of an overview of, or our first impressions, I have to mention that it is a very bad-looking game. <laughs> yeah, I think it looks mediocre. I wouldn't. The cubes are great. The board and the cards—they're just kind of dark and muddy and. Ugh. I mean, some of it might be based on the show art. But, yeah, but I mean, I think it's fine. I don't think it's awful. Like it's Battlestar Galactica has anyway. has a similar kind of approach to their to that game's aesthetics, but I think it works better there. In, in which game? Sorry, Battlestar Galactica. It's you know the cards all have hollow stills from the show, and it's a right. space backdrop. But that one just looks yeah. better, I think. Yeah, this feels like more of the second rate version of that. Yeah, yeah. In terms of how it how it looks. But yeah, no offense, Matt, but I'm going to try to play it again without you and see if we can get it down to an hour or an hour and a half. So I'm curious, I'm curious to see what my perception is of the game in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. But ultimately, I think, you know, still the king of this, this genre is dominant species without a doubt, without a doubt, at least of of these three main ones we've played. It's just so interesting on so many different axes. I think is the best way to say it. There are just so many different uh, dimensions of what's going on in dominant species. Yeah, yeah. Plus, it looks the best by far of the three games. <laughs> now that we're talking about thinking about aesthetics, I really like the look of oh, dominant yeah. species. The wooden yeah. pieces are amazing. More games need wooden cones. For goodness oh, sake. yeah, it's got cones. Man, we've been talking about cubes, but those cones, those cones are great. I want a companion cone, man. <laughs> All right. I think we have exhausted this topic. Yeah, I think that was a good discussion talking about area majority, area control in general, and also the specifics of the expanse. Uh, Like I said before, this is our first podcast in a while. Uh, We had lots of life events. I moved and Matt got married and all kinds of stuff like that. I guess those two things and then just being general, generally busy. But we will be back on schedule going forward Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. Check me out on Twitter, on Facebook. And if you would like to watch these podcasts live and be part of our awesome Discord community, go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Any and all support you can give us there is greatly appreciated. We will talk to you all again soon. Goodbye. Good night.